you wrote about this also very recently. Um, you're the only reason I subscribe to the Atlantic, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so the Atlantic should know that. Like, <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Um, you wrote about the mortality paradox, right? We can't conceive of not being here. I, I have been thinking about this so much. I'll sit there on my bike. And uh, I was thinking about it yesterday and I was really sitting there thinking, you know, how difficult is it for us to imagine the world without, with us not in it? Because every experience we have is only through our eyes, only through our senses. Um, say, say more about that because I just find this to be such a fascinating topic. Yeah, the, the port mortality paradox is, is, has to do with the fact that we're, as big brained um, mammals, we're able to understand that we're going to die intellectually. But what we can't conceive of, because our brain isn't that big, is the idea of not existing. So I know I'm going to die, but I can't imagine not existing. Those are two different phenomena, the two different cognitions. And one I can really understand, the other that I can't. And the fact that those two things are intention creates a lot of fear. It creates a lot of, of uncertainty. Uh, real discomfort, real cognitive dissonance and discomfort in people. And so the result is they're trying to work through that their whole lives. Either they'll say, okay, well, I, I'll just resolve it on the first side. I won't die. You know, well, good luck with that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, you're the longevity guy. And I heard you say, you know, I was listening to you today and you said like, the one thing we all know is that we're going to die. So if Peter Atia says, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Right. Okay. Or they try to resolve it on the other side, which is to, 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 either understand to apprehend the concept of not existing or to say, I will always exist, notwithstanding the fact that I'm going to die. And there's lots of philosophies and religions and look, I'm, I'm a, I'm a traditional Catholic. And so I've resolved it in a particular way, but the result is that of all of this is that this is a lot of what leads to people's fears. Um, uh, you know, it, people talk to me a lot about what they're most afraid of. I ask people about that a lot. And part, part of the reason is because my main focus of my happiness work is love and love and fear are opposites. Uh, love and hatred are not opposites. Hatred is downstream from fear. And this is a philosophical principle from Lao Tzu and St. John the Apostle, but it's also a, 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 a neurocognitive um, regularity where you find that, you know, how the brain works, you know, that you tend to find that love neutralizes fear and fear can turn off love and every other every other feeling like a switch because of the way that, that the brain is designed. The main focus of my work in happiness is the subject of love. Um, and part of the reason is because love is the nuclear fuel rods of happiness. If you want to know one thing about how to be happy, happiness is love full stop. And there's a ton of longitudinal data that shows this. There's a ton of data that shows, you know, people who are in their eighties and nineties who are really happy. If you look back in their twenties and thirties and forties and fifties, what they all have in common is, is strong relationships that they were cultivating and working on real love relationships in terms of romance and family and, and, and real friends, not just deal friends. Now, the interesting thing is when you're studying love is you also have to study its opposite and the opposite of love is fear. That's a, that's a, a philosophical uh, truism. You know, Lao Tzu talked about the fact that fear and love are opposite, St. John the Apostle. But also we find this in modern neuroscience and the way that emotions are processed in the human brain. Um, psychology shows this abundantly, that, op, that, that love and hatred are opposites. Hatred is downstream from fear. So if you want to understand what turns off love in your life, when people come to me and say, I don't have enough love, I'll say, well, tell me about what you're afraid of. And when people come to me and they say they have too much fear in their life, I'll say, well, we need more relationships. We need more love to neutralize the fear. Mm. So the big fears that I ask people about, one of the things that I find is that everybody has a death fear. This is an interesting thing. You know, most people say, I'm not afraid of dying. And I'm not afraid of dying. I mean, like Peter, you and I are like, you know, it's like the reaper comes tomorrow. It's like, okay, it's, uh, you know, I lived right. And I'm actually not afraid of that. It's, but I do have a death fear. Everybody does. And it, it has to do with, the extinction of how you understand yourself. And that gets back to the mortality paradox. The idea of not existing has some manifestation in almost everybody's life, whether it's, I'm really afraid of becoming irrelevant. I'm really afraid of being forgotten. That's your mortality problem. That's your death fear. You know, for me, it's like, I think about it. And the, the one thing about my health I'm most worried about is, is dementia. I'm just, it, you know, my mother was demented, was in early stage dementia when she was my age. She was mid fifties. She was in, in, in early stage dementia and she lived for another 15 years. And, and it was 
man, it was really, really bad. It was really a bad ending. And, and for me, I mean, my whole living is inside my head because these are my ideas. This is how I make a living. This is how I support my family. Furthermore, it's how it's how it's everything I, I love to do is is it has to do with my my ability to think clearly and to think creatively. So for me, my death fear is my cognitive decline. Everybody has something like this, whether it's really ego related or has to do with skill related. Everybody's got their their mortality terror. Um, and, and so this is one of the things that we need to dominate if we want to be happy. And and I have a, an exercise, believe it or not, Peter, that I give my students on how to do that. Number one is you have to figure out what it is. You have to do some serious reflection on what your death fear is. And for most of my students at Harvard is fear of failure. You know, these are super high performing. I mean, this was you. I mean, you went to Stanford and then, I mean, and you, you did all of this, you know, fancy college stuff. And so my guess is that you never had any academic failure and you were perhaps pretty afraid of academic failure because you'd never experienced it. And because it would have been problematic in your family if you'd started to fail some classes in college, I was going to guess, right? But but I'm a bit confused because what you spoke about earlier makes a lot of sense as a death failure because I see a cognitive decline right. being tied to physical death because it's an end of life thing. I'm a bit confused about what the students, these 29 year olds are equating failure in life, for example, starting a business and having it fail with actual death. Yeah. So it's basically, I am a, a success machine. Most of my students start off as very objectified by their parents, uh, where their parents say, you're the special one, you're successful, you always get A's, you're a hard worker, you know, get it done. Mm -hmm. And they start to see themselves as kind of homo economicus. They see themselves as mm -hmm. highly, you know, high performers. And, and, and they're very bright and they're very hardworking. And the result is they don't experience any failure in school. I mean, for, for me, these are absurd things. You got to be on an exam, who cares, right? Um, you know, I flunked out of college. I mean, it's like, I, I, man, I know failure, but, but for them, they've never experienced these things. So it feels like a, like a, a mortal threat because it's a threat to who they think they are, which is a successful person, somebody who never fails and is very foreign territory to them. So whether they're, mm. their death fears failure or cognitive decline or being forgotten or being irrelevant or actually dying. The technique for getting beyond this is really all the same. And it comes from, um, th that I found very successful, is to do what is called in Theravada Buddhism, the Maranasati meditation. This is the nine part death meditation that Theravada Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka and Thailand and Vietnam, um, uh, what they will, they will undertake in which often they'll contemplate corpses, photos of corpses in various states of decay and, and they'll say, I, that is me, and that is me. And they have a nine, this Marnasati is a meditation in which they, they, they imagine themselves decaying, dying, and then, you know, a rotting, bloated corpse. And then- It's so graphic. It's super graphic. It's yeah. And that's the point, right? And super accurate. Yeah. Like it really is how a human corpse decays. It's just unbelievable. And so, and, and what you're trying to do is what, what psychologists would call exposure therapy. You're exposing yourself to the inevitable truth. Like I heard you say, Peter, I'm gonna die. Okay, fine, fine, fine. I'm not gonna think. No, think about it. Think about it. Why? Because that it 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 loses its terror when it becomes familiar. So what I make my students do is a nine part meditation on their own failure, catastrophic failure by their own terms, which is not necessarily human catastrophic failure. But there'll be. I remember the first time I did this, I put the steps in because they didn't know how to do it. And the first one is. I'm falling behind my colleagues at school. Um, I, I graduate, but just barely. I'm not getting the jobs that my friends are getting and that people thought I was going to get. Um, I'm finding I'm really my career is not what I thought it was going to be. And then I get to this one point, and I, I threw this in just to, for a little bit of pathos. And, and, and I said, there's one point I say, I think my parents feel sorry for me. <laughs> and a student starts crying. Because <laughs> that's the nerve, man. That's the nerve. There's always this point in the death meditation. So figure out what death means for you, where this mortality paradox, it really has teeth. And then actually put together the exposure therapy of walking yourself through the, 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 the experience, the emotional experience of this failure, and you will be free. This is the one thing that I guarantee that you'll be free of that. Now, you, gotta, you can't do it just once. 
you have to do it again and again and again because what your fear is has very is deeply rooted in a lot of your experience. But once you're exposing yourself to, to that um, again and again, it, it it has an incredible therapeutic impact. So the exercise is obviously first taking some time to really be thoughtful about what these fears are. And and by the way, I'm guessing some people have more than one. I mean, you have the sort of the fear of actual death perhaps the fear of failure along the way. So, so you might be doing this exercise twice, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, like we, we probably all have multiple versions and they change throughout life. You know, when I was 20 years old, I wasn't afraid of cognitive decline. I'm 58 years old and I want to keep the party going is the bottom line. And the party's not going to keep going. I, I might not be demented. I might be hit by a bus tomorrow. I might be, you know, my mother-in-law died uh, last month and she was talking about a good death. She was 93. She had her marbles to the last minute and she died at home. Right. I mean, not bad, not bad. You know, chapeau. I mean, that's like that's really, really good. But everybody goes. Uh, and mm-hmm. so you can't keep these things. And, and unless you're comfortable with this inevitability, the mortality paradox, this inability to process these two competing ideas, it'll terrorize you. It'll paralyze you. It'll be a problem. What's the optimal dose of exposure? So if I was an arachnophobic and I came to you and said, you know, we, we came to the understanding that I need to be exposed to spiders, how often would we need to do this? That's a good question. And actually, uh, there are psychologists and psychotherapists who deal with this with different kinds of phobias. And they find that different people have to be exposed, have to have an exposure that's more or less frequent. (laughs) <laughs> mm. and you have to re-up it or you don't. Some people are just, they solve the problem. I mean, my my my, my little girl, she's uh, 19. When she was a baby, we adopted her from China. And and she had, you know, she had never been held and, you know, she had, she was undernourished. And, and so when she came to live with us, she was afraid of a lot of stuff. And one of the things she, she was really, really afraid of was dogs. She would see a dog outside. She would scream and, you know, she would you know, want to be. So we wanted to solve this and we did it by getting a dog, right? But we didn't just like throw the dog in the room with her in the crib. You know, we, we, we held, we kept the dog apart and it turns out there was about three days. And after about three days, she was not afraid of the dog anymore. And after about six weeks, she loved all dogs. And that was it mm. forever. She's still crazy about all dogs. She's 19 years old. She has pictures of the dog that was that dog sadly passed away, but lives in blessed memory at this point because it was her cognitive therapy, death meditation dog or or something like that. But other people who have lived with these phobias all their lives, including people who have these stresses about their own mortality, it it requires, I think, a more strenuous and, and thorough intervention and one that's more frequent. 